Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... At Villarese Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villarese provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villarese Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports from our state-of-the-art uh, Pontchartrain uh, production studios. I'm Eric Asher and uh, tonight uh, we'll talk about the Saints, LSU Tulane. We'll touch on some other uh, state schools and uh, it's every it's every time the man I, I announce he's coming on the program. Uh, it's one of our great guests. Everybody wants to hear from him. Mike Detilia of WWL Radio joins us. Mike, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Eric. Always man, we good had to have some you. New gigs tonight. Well, yeah, I'm, 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 look, I keep telling everybody. I feel like George Jefferson. Yes, you know. I went we're from moving uh, on up. I'm moving oh, on we up. We have moved. Yes, no doubt. One of them. Yeah, it looks great, though. It no, it does. They looks really. They, they worked hard on a couple of years getting this uh, getting this rolling and. Uh, I got nothing but compliments. Yeah, about it's it. awesome. Yeah, awesome. it really is. Mike, before we get started, man, this is your busiest time of the year, huh? From from now until uh, after the draft. Yeah, uh, there is no vacation. Right. I'm like a school teacher. Uh, I get off mm -hmm. a little bit in June, part mm -hmm. of July, and then back, back at it. it. So yeah, listen, but I love to do it, and uh, nothing wrong with it. You know, I, I enjoy it. That's yes. Fun part of the year, uh, especially early on. Not a, too many losses mm -hmm. for everybody. Everybody's still optimistic. Yes. And, uh, but there's always curves in the road, mm -hmm. and we caught one. We're dealing with one right now. Caught one. No doubt. Let's start with that. We'll talk with the Stains Breeze injury. Uh, you had da Dr. David Elias on your program yes. this week uh, from Thibodeau Regional, and uh, he was absolutely fantastic, talking a little bit about um, uh, the Breeze injury. We know now that Dr. Shin performed the surgery after he went and got a second opinion uh, down in Houston. Uh, that, that surgery uh, went on yesterday, from what we understand, it was a successful surgery. Now it becomes, again, uh, rehab after the cast comes off. Uh, but I think well, from, from, I had him on my program as well, you, you had him. Uh, he was great in, in just giving us an overview of what we can expect and, and what went on in the surgery. If you would, take it from there. Yeah, first thing I thought of, because you know, I work with Dr. Elias mm -hmm. and Arthur L.A., people that work mm -hmm. uh, at Thibodeau Regional Medical Center, at the Wellness Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, he explained to me, Mike, it's routine surgery. Uh, he said, doesn't matter if you 15, 25, 45, 65, 95. Mm -hmm. Um, the injury to the thumb, and he talked about, you know, how the surgery goes to repair it. And he said, there is no magic bullet. It's six weeks, six to eight weeks mm -hmm. on the return. And so, um, you know, you can say, well, he's an athlete in great shape. I asked Doc, does that make a difference? And he says, no, it, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make a difference if you're an athlete, non-athlete. Basically, it's a healing process. Mm -hmm. um, after one week, they'll give you a ball, a rubber ball that you can throw around. Mm -hmm. After two weeks, he says, you know, they'll give you the football, but you can't grip it. Mm -hmm. But you can throw it. And he said, you know, then after three, three and a half weeks, then you can start throwing a football. Uh, and then talking to Bobby Jay about it, you know, he's told me, you know, not having that thumb, your accuracy skills yes. is what trails off. Because uh, he banged his on the top of a helmet mm -hmm. one time. And he said, man, listen. You know, I wasn't the same guy for a couple of weeks, but he said, you know, eventually he, he didn't have to go in for the surgery. So what we're looking at now is a six, at least six weeks, mm -hmm. and you're looking at a situation. I felt very <laughs> strongly about it from early on. It's going to have to be done by committee. You, you, Teddy Bridgewater is not going to do this by himself. It's going to be a Teddy Bridgewater, mm -hmm. Taysom Hill show. 
tag team. Yes. Okay, you're not fighting for the singles heavyweight championship mm -hmm. anymore. You're fighting for the tag team championship yes. to win this out and figuring out a way to win. Now, you go back to the Rams game, they had a lot of fathers in that loss. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't because of Breeze. Yes. They got beat up up front, offensive mm -hmm. line-wise. Uh, they couldn't run the football, drop passes. Jared Cook was a major disappointment. Yes. Uh, and then late in the game, you know, your defense got tired, just got tired and missed tackles. And um, very concerned about the secondary. Mm -hmm. And Marcus Williams in particular, this is back-to-back -back weeks. He has not played well. I agree. He's gotten beaten deep on passes. Mm -hmm. And um, I said this in the preseason. You know, last year a lot of people felt maybe a little bit of a hangover. Mm -hmm. He has not played the same since that Minnesota game. No, I agree. 100%. No question about it. He has not played the same. Uh, going back to the Breeze thumb injury for for a moment, uh, the, the surgical tape was inserted in, in the thumb to strengthen the ligament. Uh, from what Dr. Elias has said, that will even strengthen it even more right. going forward, which is good news for, for Breeze, uh, you know, as he comes back w within a contact sport. So, as you mentioned, six weeks, no magic bullet. Now it's, it's up to Bridgewater and, and, and uh, Teddy uh, and, uh, and Taysom Hill. How do you think this split's going to be? I think they're going to use Taysom Hill in the RPO game. I'm surprised he didn't do it last week against the Rams. Uh, and, and Bridgewater will be the starter. Obviously, he'll run the offense. What's your take? What do you think is going to happen there? You think that, that they'll have him under center? Uh, have I think Taysom they'll have him the under center. I do think so. Because you know what? you got to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm an opposing defense, I have to prepare for Teddy. Yes. And Taysom now. Mm -hmm. It's just True. not one guy. I understand a little bit last week, just a strange set of events with Traquan getting hurt, yes. you had uh, Kirkwood gets hurt mm -hmm. in practice before the game. Right, right, right. And so now you're down to just a couple of receivers, mm -hmm. and Ted Ginn was hurt. Right. So now you're down to just a couple and how that would all work out. But you saw a very tentative Terry Bridgewater, uh, late with his throws. But that's what you would expect from a guy who really has not played in a meaningful game. Yes. You can't count that final game uh, of last year. And what I tell everybody, preseason is a mirage. Yes. What you see there a lot is a mirage. I've seen quarterbacks that look great in preseason. Mm -hmm. You put them in a regular season game and they two words, lousy. Mm -hmm. They can't play. So now you've got to figure out something to use the best attributes of Bridgewater mm -hmm. and what he can do best, which is the short game. Yes. That's what he does best. Have him feel more comfortable in the pocket. I thought he did not feel comfortable, and he felt phantom pressure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it wasn't even there, but he felt it. Yeah. And he was getting rid of the football, and almost like, uh, I would say, almost like a yo-yo. Almost like he wanted to throw it, and then the ball would come out, but almost like he wanted to peel it back. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to be decisive with your throws. And with Taysom, I think they will run the RPOs, but I also think they're going to let him throw the ball. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt about it okay. because, again, that's going to put pressure defensively to figure out what you want to do. And my thing with Taysom is going to be here. Hey, listen, your primary guy is not open. Second guy, you're going to take a quick look, Go. take off running. Right. You know, uh, you. I mean, defenses today, he's a unique player yes. that you have to defend. And so uh, I do think it's going to be by committee. How it's cut, I'm not real sure. Right. Is this going to be a 70-30 cut? Right. Is it 60-40, whatever? I know this. You were taking out an NFL Hall of Fame quarterback that put in Taysom Hill. Please. So you're going to convince me that they're not going to do it? Right. You know, now that's what you've got to do it. That's what surprised about last week. You know, again, you, you, even when Breeze went down, and I understand there's a shock there, and you want Teddy to feel comfortable, why, and they weren't running the football effectively. Why they didn't go to more of the RPO? Just a few plays to kind of open things up some. Yeah, I, I thought probably that would have happened again. But I understand the wide receiver position, yes. too. Uh, that played certainly a part of right, it. Right, because he was a backup wide receiver there. Yeah. Well. And now your game plan, you know, when you come up with this, is about building it toward the strength mm -hmm. of Drew Brees. Yes. Now, all of a sudden, that's taken away. Now it's almost like, okay, now what we do? It's the same thing about everybody. Oh, it'll all be great. Don't worry about it. What? Come on. You're talking about it's hard to win in this league, mm -hmm. even with Drew Brees. The road's going to be rougher without him. Yes. And especially the next two weeks because of who you play. 
you have not beaten Seattle in Seattle since 2007. Yes. Pete's had your number. Now, last time they played him in a dome, that was a really good football mm-hmm. game, and you would end up uh, defeating Seattle. But Pete's got pretty good home field advantage out there. Yes. And he, unbelievable number for winning in September. You know, he, he's always been a pretty fast starter off the bat, especially when you're playing out there. And the Cowboys, uh, no matter if you hate them or not, right. you know, I work with a dude that, you know, yeah. he refuses to say Cowboys. It's Cowgirls with him. Mm-hmm. You got to admit, they're playing really good football right now, and you're going up against a really good defense. The next two weeks are going to be tough. Right. But then after that, mm-hmm. okay, the Jacksonvilles and mm-hmm. Tampa Bays of the world, Arizona, you should win those games. Yes. So if you split it, let's say you three and three in six mm-hmm. games, I'll take that. Right. I think everybody would. Of course, you got Dallas on a short week as well, which doesn't help. Well, it don't matter if you're short or long. Right. You, you, you got to talk about a tail with them. They are really good. Um, you obviously scouted Teddy Bridgewater for your book. Uh, he was a guy at, um, at Louisville that moved around a bit. He moved around in his first year with the Vikings a bit. Uh, he seemed to have now as, as kind of settled as a pocket passer. Uh, I'm surprised he doesn't get out and, and didn't get out and run more or try to create time with his, with his legs. He was never really a runner. He was a guy that would create extra time right. and making mm-hmm. extend that play. Mm-hmm. He would run when he had to, mm-hmm. but he was never per se a runner. Like a Watson. Right. He, he's not mm-hmm. nothing in that category. And he liked to sit in the pocket, but he's always got what I call a drift. When he takes a snap, he drifts a little bit here mm-hmm. and drifts a little bit here, and he looks for his guy. What I see the difference today is in Minnesota, he would move a little bit more left and right. Today, he's in the pocket. Mm-hmm. Doesn't have a lot of drift unless there's pressure on him. Mm-hmm. Uh, then he'll start to drift. But that's the difference I see with the Bridgewater in Minnesota who would move a little bit left, uh, move a little bit right. But that could have been part of the scheme they had him at also, where I think, you know, with Sean, he'd rather have him sit in the pocket, take that one step up, make the throw. But he wasn't decisive. But I get it. I get it. He hasn't played. Football's not a switch. Mm -hmm. We're not playing in the backyard. Okay, this is the real man's game here. And to have 11 penalties and to have every offensive lineman you play get a penalty. Right. And... My thing about it is, it goes to show people in national media, they don't, a lot of times don't know what the hell they're talking mm-hmm. about. And I heard Skip Bayless said that Aaron Donald is not a dominant player oh, in this league. What plan is he on? And my thing about it is, that's a joke. Now, if he's doing that just to kind of poke the bear mm-hmm. to get a reaction, I get it. But I think he really meant mm-hmm. it. Aaron Donald, you just look, he didn't have to have a sack to be dominant. I saw it back-to-back plays. He beat Andrews Pete on one mm-hmm. play. He beat Larry Wolford on the other, and he came mm-hmm. back and he was talking to Eric McCoy like, okay, you next on the list, mm-hmm. buddy. Mm-hmm. Uh, every play, he created something. Mm-hmm. He led the league in sacks last year. You know what was the first game he had a sack? Week four. Wow. Did not realize that. But, again, he causes you so many right. problems. He wreaks havoc. And he opens up everything for Michael Brockers mm-hmm. and Dante Fowler. Yeah. And so, you know, man, when I heard that, I'm like, there is, you just watching highlight films. Mm-hmm. That's all you watching. But your job as a national guy is to tell people who's the dominant players. Mm-hmm. And if you can't figure out that Aaron Donald is not dominant, then you shouldn't have that job you got. Yes. Adjustment by the receivers. Breeze throws a, a, a catchable ball, but he throws players open. Teddy seems to hold the ball a little bit longer and relies on his rocket arm to get the ball out there. He throws the ball with more RPMs. Uh, you're going into a place where maybe it'll be uh, raining. You know, there's a good chance Seattle may be raining. How much of an adjustment for the receivers? We saw quite a few balls going through the hands of receivers on uh, last week against Los Angeles. That part I don't get because it doesn't matter. To me, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. if he's throwing it a little bit harder mm-hmm. or whatever. To me, that was a concentration mm-hmm. issue there with receivers. That wasn't there last week. It was not there. That you saw the week I mean, before. Michael Thomas had a drop. I mean, what, he had did three all last year. Yeah. And then you had Cook. You know, we praised mm. him all preseason and oh, yes. everything else. And then, you know, he's, you know, my thing is, what are you doing? Because mm-hmm. the interception on Drew is him. Yep. You got to make that catch. Yes. No matter if you take the big hit or not, mm-hmm. you have to make that catch. And he drops another real easy one in his hands. And he had a third one mm-hmm. that he could have made that he didn't come up with either. So, again, uh, when you win, 
you know, everybody takes a little bit of credit. Yes. And when you lose, everybody got to take a little credit. True. You got beat up last week. What is getting masked with the breeze injury and a bad call mm -hmm. was how poorly you played on offense. Yes. True. Couldn't move the ball. Penalties almost done. Every time you had a positive play for the most part, a penalty brought it back. Uh, the offensive line was porous. I mean, again. And that was the strong point week one. Yes. And so, but, you know, you're talking about different people here. Right. And, again, Donald makes that type mm -hmm. of difference where um, – I can't think of the lineman's name, but he was saying, you know, we played against Lawrence. Oh, John Runyon. Mm -hmm. uh, John was like, you know, going up against LT, it wasn't so much, you know, you looked at him, you know, he wasn't a real big guy mm -hmm. and everything, but he said almost like I could smell him, almost like, you know, he had he could put that fear, mm -hmm. and, and you knew he was coming at you. Right. And I think Donald brings that in today's game. I think Khalil Mack has that same yes. sort of feature mm -hmm. with the Chicago Bears. Also, too, I thought the Saints' defensive line, for the most part, played pretty well. Right. They, they, they're putting pressure on the quarterback, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of pressure. They're doing a lot of different mm -hmm. things inside. And uh, Cam Jordan, I mean, you can't ask him to do anything more than what he's doing. Uh, hopefully, and I think pretty soon, I think Sheldon Rankins will be back mm -hmm. in the mix. And who has really surprised me he's played well when he's got his opportunities has been Shy Tuttle. Yes. Uh, a rookie free agent. Mm -hmm. And he was a guy who was a five-star recruit coming out of high school goes to Tennessee he's got injuries uh, I don't know what's going on in Tennessee either but right. they're not developing players no, either not. and the last two weeks very similar to little Jordan Humphrey mm -hmm. he has he made that run mm -hmm. and so interesting up front I think he'll get better there they did better against the run this week they, right. they couldn't do any worse than they played against the Texans sure uh, but again then you lose a starter and Anzalone but fortunately you made the trade for Alonzo that he'll be able to step in there. He'll do a good job. Yeah. Um, as far as the, the quarterbacks go, uh, you look at what uh, Houston did, but more importantly what the Rams did. They, they had everybody in the box. Uh, you look at the Seattle defense, the front seven, their strong front seven. Uh, they've got to be able to prove they can throw the ball. And, and I think they got to take some shots deep here to open up this offense so that, again, that safety is not going to be down in the box like we saw last week with the Rams. That's why I'm a big believer in this. I think early in the game, Taysom Hill is going to throw one deep. Get that safety out of there, mm. you know. So you got to throw it deep. Yes, you do. And I think it wouldn't surprise me that they have a play drawn mm -hmm. up where they throw one deep with Taysom throwing it to try to get that safety out of that box mm -hmm. and have him play deep downfield. But Teddy's got to set this up, too, mm -hmm. uh, and that it just can't be that five, six-yard pass. You've got to stretch the field a little bit. The one thing Drew does so well, and you see Brady do it and Rivers and all, he throws the ball and a guy catches it and he's got an opportunity to run right. with it afterwards. The one thing with Teddy, he's almost waiting yes. for the guy to get open before he makes mm -hmm. the throw. And that is a little bit, too, of not playing. Mm -hmm. And you can say preseason, but I'm just telling you, it's a totally different yeah. world. Yeah, I agree. Breeze throws players open. Teddy waits till they make waits the break. Till they get and he uses his arm strength to try to get the ball yeah, there. There's, there's no he doubt tries about to it. drill it in a short window. He does. Where with Drew, he's not going to put that thing, mm -hmm. you know, he's putting it in a small window. But he's leading you to make that throw for you to get something after the catch. Plus, he is at this point, and because the offense was built around him, he understands that and trusts a receiver is going to be in a certain position, a first certain spot, okay, when he's letting that ball go, where Teddy's kind of waiting on the guy to get out of his break, and then he's using the arm strength to get to him. That's rapport. Right. But cause you, and you build that up o over, over time. a period of time. Right. Teddy's got a little bit of that now, mm -hmm. and certainly with a week or And I think he'll have much more success mm -hmm. this week than he ha had last week, only because I think this is his team. You know, when you walked in there last week, and you saw Drew standing up, mm -hmm. you know, I think he always thought, you know, he might walk back out here and yeah. say, hey, listen, get lost. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is my team, you know, get back out there. The indication to me was early when he came out and he walked and Drew tried to pick up the ball and he just dropped it. Mm -hmm. I knew right then and there he wasn't he playing. Coming no back. Well, you saw it on his face. If you look yeah. back and look at the film, you know, when he's looking at Breeze as Breeze drops the ball and walks up, it's like, okay, it's my team. And what did get shown, uh, my buddy Dean Cochran, who's from mm -hmm. New Orleans, went to Tulane. Uh, he's now in the movie business mm -hmm. now. He's actually got a film. He's about 12 rows up. Drew takes the ball and he tries to throw it. And it would be like... 
having my little five-year-old granddaughter throw one. Mm -hmm. He takes it and sort of lobs it, and then he does this with, mm -hmm. with his... And when That's he sent a, me that, I was like, yeah, oh, oh, ligaments oh detached. this ain't good. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Seahawks' front seven. Really good linebackers, pretty good defensive line, but also the, back, the defensive backfield, which is not the Legion of Bloom anymore. Uh, give us your Nothing synopsis. On, yeah, give us your synopsis on that defense. It's, uh, look, they're very good against the run. Uh, the, throw the ball at them. Right, I would agree. You're gonna have to, which again puts it on the quarterback. Yeah. And offensive line protecting. Right, uh, and, and now and now a possibility of Pete maybe being out and, and and clap moving in full time until he comes back. We don't know what that situation is. My thing is, what did this tell you about Nick Easton? Well, it tells you it was a mistake. Bingo. It tells you it was a mistake. At that point in time, mm -hmm. and Max made the decision, not before free agency, mm -hmm. but at least he gave you some time. Right. That's why you made the, the deal mm -hmm. to move up to get Eric McCoy. I, I told you that the week after they picked yep. him, he's going to be the starting right, center. It's not going to be Nick Easton. Mm -hmm. All this controversy. And listen, you need something to write. And I get it. But if you've watched Nick Easton with the Vikings, come on. He ain't beating out Eric McCoy right. for his spot. And the fact that he was inactive last mm -hmm. week, inactive. And look the money you're paying him. It tells me he's one and done. Mm -hmm. He's going to come in here, have his year, Move off. Off. Right. I would agree. Uh, but I do think it's so much, while we f sort of follow the ball all the mm -hmm. time, the, the line play to me is going to be significant. And you've got to run the ball now. Mm -hmm. You've got to take some of that pressure off your quarterback uh, to do it. And that's how I would go after the Seahawks. You've got to try to run the football a little bit, then throw a little short stuff. Uh, what you're going to see is one of the best middle linebackers in the game today. But we talk about Luke Keekley. We don't see Bobby Wagner play a lot. Right, because on the West Coast. He's a stud player. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's at that highest level mm -hmm. of middle linebacker play. You're right, the secondary isn't nearly as good, and they aren't as physical. And the mm -hmm. rules changed on yeah. them a little bit. Mm -hmm. They can't get away with all that pulling and tugging like they used to. So you would hope that you can get a little bit of a running game going, mm -hmm. then you can throw the football at them. But I'm telling you, Eric, early in the game, you got to take a shot down. I agree 100%. You, you got to end. No Earl Thomas mm -hmm. in the lineup. Now, they did get Clowney, who's changed as a player. When I saw him at South Carolina, he was a speed, quickness guy. And man, pop, 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 get around you, he's on the quarterback. He's changed. He's a power player today. He's explosive, but he's a power player. He's a good NFL pass rusher. Mm -hmm. Not an elite one, a good one. Where he's really good? Gets the run. Mm -hmm. He plays the run very well for a defensive That's end. That's a big difference for South Carolina. Because his deal was, man, get off no, the field. Right. I'm almost rush a quarterback. Right, sure. Uh, it was almost a Greg Williams line. Mm -hmm. Man, just play the run along the way. Get to the quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> just get there. But you see today he's mm -hmm. a much more disciplined player mm -hmm. against the run. But he's a power player today. He's not the speed, quickness guy yeah. we saw at South Carolina. But uh, they're still really good on defense. Pete Carroll's one of the best coaches in the game. Agreed. And offensively, he wants to run the ball. Mm -hmm. He wants to run it. His receiving core. You know, losing Doug Baldwin hurts because mm -hmm. he was a guy that really could stretch right. the field. I think he was one of the more underrated players mm -hmm. in the NFL. I think this about Russell Wilson. I think he's an elite quarterback. And he's the best improvisational quarterback in the game. And the fact that, okay, we're going to blitz him. And he gets away from there, and he can create a play either with his feet mm -hmm. or he extends a play, and he gives a receiver an extra second or two to beat a defensive back. Listen, you can't cover forever. Right. Eventually, you know, you got to turn him loose. And he does that better than anybody in the game today. And what I've noticed about their wide receivers are they understand when he starts this improvisation, come back, they're, they're come getting back, open. Come back, they're come getting back. open. They're giving him a target, okay? Uh, it's almost like they know exactly. He knows what they're going to do. They know what he's going to do. A uh, new guy that's involved in it now is the tight end, Disley. He's getting a lot, a lot of, lot, a lot of touches and now. He's never known to be a no, receiver. Right. He was a blocker. Right. He was like an extra tackle. Mm -hmm. But they've gotten him more involved in mm -hmm. that short, quick passing game. Listen, he ain't out racing nobody. No. But he can catch the football really well. Uh, Metcalf's a, 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 their deep threat, right? You're right, and, and DK is this big, mm -hmm. physical right. guy that he's like a basketball forward. You know, he'll run a certain route, and then he'll just sit mm -hmm. there, and he sort of boxes you out. Give it mm -hmm. to me. Right. How? And he catches it. Mm -hmm. Okay, how many six-foot-four quarterbacks they got in the NFL? Mm -hmm. Zero. Right. So, but he's still a rookie, and 
you're trying to throw him off of his route mm -hmm. a little bit. Maybe just kind of a little mm -hmm. bit of a jam throw him off his route. But again, you need help on the back end. Von Bell is playing well. He really is. But Marcus Williams, uh, he's I mean, become a liability. I, I agree with you 100%. Lockett is the other is the other receiver who is a terrific receiver for them. And he's got speed. Now, he's yeah. not a real big kid. So no, if you send him go. deep downfield, the hardest thing, Joe Clark, who lives not far from me, he mm -hmm. coached 50 years in the NFL, he's like, the hardest thing about throwing a ball deep downfield is finding him. Mm -hmm. so if you're a quarterback, okay, and that field's got that little bit of an arc. Right, it does. Okay, where is he? Where is he? Mm -hmm. So you're trying to get it on a timing issue, he had that with Doug Baldwin. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much of that he's got with Lockett. But you know what? I think the Saints mm -hmm. keep this game close. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a close game. Now, listen, Seattle, no breeze. I think Seattle wins this game. Mm -hmm. But I think the Saints will keep this game close. Seattle's not a team that's going to blow the, no. the doors off you. Well, Mason Rudolph almost beat him last week. I mean, if it wasn't for the pass interference penalty, again, they got a chance to come back and win that yeah. game. And I mean, that's a guy who just came off the bench, a third round pick from the from the year before. So uh, with I mean, virtually no playing no, time. Right. That's the that's the biggest, I, I guess, surprise when you see a guy like Minshew coming off the bench for, for Jacksonville and being able to operate within the offense. Rudolph coming off the bench for Pittsburgh, being able to operate in the offense. And Bridgewater, who was a Pro Bowl quarterback, coming off the bench but still looking tentative. Tells me that uh, you don't have your quarterback at a future on this roster. Man, listen, I can sell it mm -hmm. to you. I could be a used car salesman and say, oh, this guy's the next mm -hmm. Steve Young. Uh, Teddy's he's a starting quarterback. Come on. They're going to have this sh is going to show you over the next mm -hmm. six weeks. Yes. This football team is going to have to spend uh, early round pick, most likely to be a first round pick. Mm -hmm. You don't have a second. Right. You're going to have to spend that and get a young quarterback to be the eventual successor to Drew Brees. Well, you know how that goes. I'm like, I mean, how many you – know, we got we – got, so many teams out there that have auditioned quarterbacks. Look at the Cleveland Browns over and over again, bust after bust after bust. you got to get the right guy, and that's hard to do in the NFL. It is, but your hit ratio today is better than it's ever been really? on quarterbacks okay. coming out of college. It really has been. And you have the occasional miss mm -hmm. on the early first-round pick. But you just look at the young guys, if it's Deshaun Watson mm -hmm. and Carson Wentz. Yes. And I think Sam Darnold has got a chance Me to be too. really good in this league. Baker's always going to be a little erratic. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, you know what you got with, with Mayfield in this spot. Uh, you know, you look at Kyler Murray. You can't tell me that kid mm -hmm. can't play. Right. Uh, no, he can play in this league and, and really good. So the ratio is much better. And I think they're more adept to playing in the NFL because NFL teams are embracing college mm -hmm. concepts. Because if I've got a young quarterback, I've got to do it to get him ready to play. That's why the Giants, okay, they pulled a plug on Eli, mm -hmm. okay? But a lot of that has to do with the fact we've adapted a little few things that basically what he did at Duke mm -hmm. onto the Giants. And, and a lot of teams want to play their quarterbacks immediately. They, if you understand, you got to get them on the field. The hard thing with the Saints is if you're picking middle of the, uh, of the first round or end of the first round, it's hard to get those franchise-type quarterbacks. Yeah, and, you know, I was doing a show today nationally, and one of the things I said, you know, I think back a few years ago, what if Buffalo had select, used that pick and selected Marshawn Lattimore, mm -hmm. the Saints pick next, it would have been Patrick Mahomes. Right. But I think that yeah, the cat got out the bag, mm -hmm. and Andy Reid said, oh, wait a minute, if he's there, right. so let's move up to the Bills spot, one pick ahead of the Saints. Mm -hmm. Somebody sort of leaked it out that the Saints would have picked Mahomes uh, at that particular point. Right. So but you never know. I mean, that, that's just the way it goes. My thing about it is, I see what the Bears have at quarterback. How could you have picked that guy right. ahead of the other two, you know, with Deshaun and Patrick? Right. Come on, I mean, who's you know who made that selection? Uh, the guy that used to be here. <laughs> he made a wrong one. That's all <laughs> yeah, I can tell him. A couple more questions about the Saints, and then we'll take a break, and we'll move on to the college game. Um, it's kind of a lump of clay here with 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 Peyton in terms of his game plan. How different of a game plan do you think we'll see? How exotic? What do you think happens? Yeah, there? I think the one thing with Sean. You don't want to back him into the corner. Mm -hmm. And I think he feels backed right now. Mm -hmm. That everybody's, well, you guys got no shot without Breeze. None. And I think he, you know, he's, he knows enough about what Teddy and Taysom can do well. Mm -hmm. He'll play to their strengths. And um, 
Sean's pretty good at the play calling, and he'll come up with something to keep him there. But, you know, again, you can't keep your defense on the field mm -hmm. like what happened against L.A. Right. You just can't do it. you got to get first downs, You got to, and you can't always rely on Will Lutz. Will Lutz has become like Martin Anderson. Uh, you, know, you get at the 30-yard no line, okay, tweet, it, right. kill it, let's go for the and field And who would have thought that in a Peyton offense? Right. Nobody. It happened last week. Right. It happened mm -hmm. last week. So you got to, and I think getting on them early with a little bit of success, mm -hmm. I think that's so important. Yeah. Yeah, you build upon that. Confidence. Okay, we got some confidence here. Because people talk about momentum. Man, momentum lasts you long enough to get hit in the mouth. Yeah. But confidence that you can do it, getting a quick score, and also having your defense come up with turnovers. I think that's the one thing this defense still, and it's early, that you got to create turnovers on defense. Eli Apple, Marcus Williams. Talk about the secondary with those two guys right now. Well, you knew what you were getting with Eli. Right, Apple. he's going to be a grabby guy. If the officials allow you to play, he's going to be a dynamic. He's going to he's going to play well for you. Yeah. If if they're going to call it tight, uh, he's going to be. It's going to be flag city. Another thing too is now they picking on Lattimore too. Yeah, they, they know that he's not having help over the top. Mm, right. So they picking on him right. uh, also. So. It's been the biggest disappointment early on. Mm -hmm. The secondary has not played well at all, with the exception of Von Bell. Mm -hmm. I think Von's played really, I, I really well. Contract year for Von as well. And my thing is, you know, I, I had a long talk with somebody about this. They were talking about he's not a core player. I said, well, spell me core. I don't know. If I, he ain't a core player, I don't know who right. he is. Well, no, Von Bell is a core football player for your football team. And he would be priority for me to, to bring back. But Marcus Williams, Eli Apple not playing well. And I'll be honest with you, P.J. Williams, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. he, he slipped back to the P.J. Yeah. we oh, saw oh, earlier. Right. Uh, so can that get better? Yes. But it's the biggest disappointment so far this season, the secondary play. I talked about this this week on my show. Uh, after the, uh, the blown call by Walt Anderson, the, uh, the inadvertent whistle, um, this is the third time, third game in a row where the Saints have had, uh, obviously, the, the officiated calls go against them. Walt Anderson is 67 years old. He's been, he's been uh, officiating since 1996. Uh, there was a stat that they showed in the Seattle game. 68-year-old head coaches in the NFL. Pete Carroll, Tom Coughlin, Dick Vermeil, Marv Levy, George Hallis. Now, if a head coach in a, for a football team has never been over 68 years old, Okay, um, they've only had those those players those coaches been 68. This game has changed dramatically since the 60s, 70s, 80s. It's a faster game. Uh, the players are bigger, stronger. They've got to get younger with their officiating, and I think they got to go to full-time officials. 67 years old. No disrespect to anybody out there. I'm closer to the 67 than I am to 47, okay? But at the same yeah. time, I'm not playing basketball anymore right. because I know I can't play anymore, right. okay? Uh, they, they, they've got to be able to start looking at these at the ages of these officials. You can't have a 67-year-old official out there trying to officiate an NFL game now. The other thing, too, is you better know the rules. Amen. And this is back-to-back -back weeks. Come on. Uh, with veteran officials not understanding the rules. I agree with you. It's got to be full-time. Got to be. Listen, if you an insurance salesman, if you work at a bank, whatever you do, you're going to have to make the choice. Mm -hmm. Now, well, could they raise the salary up? Yeah. But my thing about it is you got to give up your other job. Right. This has to be a full-time position. Mm -hmm. But here's where the NFL hits the brakes. Union. Now I'm going to have to pay you benefits. Mm -hmm. I blame this squarely on the back of NFL owners. Mm -hmm. They control the commissioner. They tell him what to do. And every year you hear a lot of NFL owners, well, we want to hear back from our fans. Right. Tell us what can change the game. Well, you've got people, well, I don't like where I sit. they got a loud mouth next to me. I don't like where I park is too far. You know, the beer is too high, mm -hmm. whatever. But what do you hear mostly? Mm -hmm. Officiating. Yeah. So my thing is, if you're hearing it, why can't you not transfer? Well, every other league has full-time officials. Why well, not the NFL? Here's my thing, and because we've had her on our show a mm -hmm. number of times, Gay Coverhouse, right. who's the former owner of the Tampa mm -hmm. Bay Bucks. Yes. Uh, her dad owned the team. Mm -hmm. She represented her dad, and she would say numerous times, I'd bring up things about changing of officials. And they always have, like she said, a cartel of mm -hmm. five or six owners. Gay, you're making a ton of money. Don't worry about the officiating. It's, it's not a big thing. They're blown calls all the time. You can't take it that way anymore because no. you know why? You can get it off of a little bit of a cell phone mm -hmm. and watch every play now right. and see everything that happens instantly. Well, and also, again, 
legalized gambling plays a huge part. A huge I was going to bring that up. Yep. That's the second part. Now, gambling has now gotten involved mm -hmm. here where people uh, are now sponsorships mm -hmm. involved right. with right. teams, everything else. And I have a gentleman who grew up in Thibodeau. I've known him. He's mm -hmm. now the chief odds maker for the Wynn Corporation mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. He said, you know what this hurts? Us. Mm -hmm. And we are eventually going to slam this down and say, wait a minute, y'all better change this. Because you know what it makes it look bad? This ain't real. Mm -hmm. This is fixed. Right. These it, games it's, are fixed. It's and WWE. My, uh, yeah, exactly. It's all predetermined. Mm -hmm. And so that deal is, wait a minute, you're not going to gamble no more mm -hmm. if you think it's right. not the up and up. So that's touching my money. Mm -hmm. And he's preached about this the last couple of years, that something's going to happen in a meaningful game now, you might have thought the NFC Championship <laughs> game was a game. pretty meaningful game. Yeah. But he said, you know, I think it would probably have to happen on Super Bowl Sunday. Mm -hmm. All of the world's watching, and it affects the point right. spread. And now what? Because, like, you know, listen, we got a spineless commissioner. He doesn't want to do no. anything. He is controlled by the 32 owners. People want to blame him. He's just doing what they tell him to do. There's no doubt. He, he's, this isn't Pete Rozelle. Right. Well, Pete had a lot of say oh, and a he, lot of power. And he had that final say on everything. Mm -hmm. This guy doesn't have the final say. Yes. Owners, certain owners tell him what to do, and that's what he does. But I blame this on ownership. Okay, you're going to have to spend money. It's going to have to be part of the new CBA. Agreed. Full-time officials, pay them more. Mm -hmm. But if you had a job before, I don't care if you're making 200 grand. Matter. You're going to have to make your choice. Mm -hmm. you Either be you official? do this or you don't. Can't, can't agree with you more. Mike Gicelli is with us from WWL Radio. I'm Eric Asher, your host. Uh, we'll take a quick break, hear from our underwriters. We'll come back. We'll talk Tulane, LSU, and the college game. Don't go anywhere. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration has been family-owned and operated since 1989. Burkhart has energy-efficient solutions and offers brands such as Mitsubishi Ductless AC Units and Amena, the only manufacturer with a lifetime unit replacement warranty. Burkhart's offers maintenance bundle packages that include servicing your AC, generator, and tankless water heater. For more information on the services Burkhart's provides, visit acpromise.com. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration, providing comfort for life. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the Best of Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Mike DeChilier with us tonight from WBL Radio. We switch gears to the Tulane Green Wave, getting ready to uh, take on Houston, uh, a uh, uh, AAC game uh, at Yeoman, nationally televised on ESPN. It's getting ready it is to kick a good off. one, too. It is going to be a good one. Um, I think it's the most defining game of the Willie Fritz era. It could be. It could be. Um, you know, I, I talked to Coach last week, and I told him the difference I see with this Tulane team than other teams, especially over the last 18 years. Defensive line play. Hardest positions to get. Yep. And I told him I, there is no question, especially with Patrick up front, mm -hmm. he's an NFL player. Mm -hmm. There ain't no question about it. Uh, that this is the best defensive line. You're talking about front seven. I've ever seen at Tulane over the last 10 or 12 years. He said, Mike, I agree with you, and it may be the best defensive line and depth I've ever had as a coach. That's saying something. And so, you know, that kind of caught my mm -hmm. radar a little mm -hmm. bit that he's, he's telling you this isn't your typical Tulane mm -hmm. defense that would give up a ton of points. Right. Um, Secondary isn't as good as it was a year True. ago, but two of them cats is playing in the NFL. Yeah. So, you know, again, you understand that part. But, man, their defensive front is really good. They can put a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on the quarterback. They've got a lot of athleticism. Uh, as I said before, Patrick Johnson, he's just a true, but, man, he's a big-time player. But tonight, they play in a dude at quarterback for the Cougars who's really good. Derek yeah. King. Talk oh, about man, he, you know, he's, he's not the biggest guy in the world, but dynamic. He can throw the football extremely well. Mm -hmm. He was no more as a runner. Yeah. But what you've seen him today, he has become a really good passer. Mm -hmm. And if you watch him, 
one of the things the Cougars do, and I saw they did it against Oklahoma, they would take him in his designated plays. He moves to the left, he spots a receiver, pow. Moves to the right, spot a receiver. So they get him into the football real quick out of his hands, where he doesn't feel pressure. And then what I call a setup play. Takes it out of the shotgun, it's a long extended play, and he wants the ends to come hard, mm -hmm. takes off. Yeah. He sees an open spot, takes off downfield. The Cougars are who they are. They're an explosive offensive team. So you got to get them off the field because yeah. their defense <laughs> uh, ain't nothing to write home to mom about, mm -hmm. put it to you that way. Uh, and, you know, listen, uh, Justin McMillan, this, you know, sometimes the man upstairs puts mm -hmm. you in the right place, yes. right time, and they put him at Tulane, right place, right mm -hmm. time. He's got a good receiving core. And Darius is a big thunder back. Yeah. Uh, this might be the deepest backfield they've ever had. Not. Nah, it's been a long time, right. Eric. Been a long time. I mean, time. they go four to five deep in that backfield. And, and so they can hit you a couple of different ways. Right. You know what Darius is going to give you. Mm -hmm. He's going to give be he's going to be the thunder yes. back. But then they can hit you with the quickness mm -hmm. coming out the edge. And Justin's got enough mobility mm -hmm. that he puts you on edge a little bit. And one of the things I would do against the Cougars, because I saw Jalen Hurts do it, is, okay, he takes the ball, he looks downfield, looks downfield, and all of a sudden the, the end sort of collapse mm -hmm. and take off running down the middle, you know, take right. off running. And you can get your first down that way, but this is a good Tulane football mm -hmm. team, and the reason they're really good, defense. Yes, no doubt. Defense. That's the difference. Agree. They can score, mm -hmm. but they also can stop you and get you off the mm -hmm. field. In the past, Eric, that wasn't the case. No. You were in shootout games right. each week. The offense was what you thought about with Tulane. They right. always bring in the good off. Because, again, the skill position players we have in Louisiana. And every once in a while, they get a pretty good quarterback, and, they, and they, they can move the football. And the other thing, too, is, and I told this to Willie, in doing a lot of camps, um, it was rare over the years that you, you would talk to a high school kid. You know he's being recruited. Mm -hmm. And he would bring up Tulane in the discussion. You know, most of the kids here, mm -hmm. Tulane, uh, not even in the discussion. But today you do. Mm -hmm. And he told me, so I'm glad you told me. I said, right. no, you can see it in the way they've recruited and the commitments mm -hmm. they've gotten so far. How many of those guys are local right. young men now? And he's being helped. He said, well, you better answer it than I did. I think when Ed, once Ed Ogeron made the decision last December, and I came on your show and sure told you, did. national you recruiting guy, uh, he's like, Mike, we got to do it different. We got to do it different. We got to go after some of the big guys. And I never thought I would see it, Washington, D.C., Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, in that area, him being able to grab recruits. Mm -hmm. I knew out west he had connections. Mm -hmm. In the northeast, that's never mm -hmm. happened, right. never at LSU. Now that opens up, I'm going to say four, five, maybe even six mm -hmm. spots that would have went to Louisiana players you got to grab some of that. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to catch a portion of that. Because why? Mississippi State's mm -hmm. here now, bigger than ever before. Yep. You got Utah, who's hit here pretty hard. Uh, you have some of the Texas schools, like a TCU, especially in the northern mm -hmm. part of the state. But you got to grab some of those guys. Mm -hmm. You got to grab them because you know who's doing it? Billy Napier mm -hmm. at University of Louisiana yeah. with Raging Cajuns. You talk to a lot of these kids. University of Louisiana is brought up in almost mm -hmm. every conversation. I would say not for the ones, but for the twos, threes, yeah. fours. Right. It's brought up. Billy's done a real good job figuring it out mm -hmm. that if Ed's going to change, no, we want to grab that because here's the deal. If you grab the two guy, then I might be able to grab the two B and two C mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have gotten before. So it's kind of a, right. a trickle-down effect. Another thing I think that helped Tulane was – Ed Ogeron, working with Willie Fritz with that camp and, and bringing those kids in and, and having the dual camp. I think that helped a lot as well. Yeah, that's partially to keep Tom Herman from yeah, doing it too. Because that's what Tom wanted right. to do. Tom wanted to come he in He wanted here. to come in, right. He wanted to do that camp with Willie Fritz. And so, listen, I give Coach O credit. Man, a lot of people, oh, man, he's just a guy from the body and all that. Yeah. Listen, no, he's Look, pretty sharp on oh, what he's no doing. Doubt. But I do think, Eric, that you hear it more now from recruits. You look at what they have now mm -hmm. already. Is it 21 or 22 verbal commitments mm -hmm. already? Yeah. So that means their class is pretty full yeah. uh, at this point. Now, you might lose somebody out of that, but still, you've got a big chunk of that already done. You're hearing it from recruits, and I do think Coach O's decision to go national, which will bring him eight, nine more, 
is going to have an effect in Louisiana. Right. Now, you, Mississippi State, to me, is trying to take full advantage of it. I see more Mississippi State coaches than I've ever seen before in my life. And worst of all, they got my number. So, <laughs> so I'm getting calls from them. Let's switch to LSU. By the way, I like Tulane tonight. How, how do you, you like Houston or Tulane? Uh, I'm going to go with Houston. I think it's close, but I right. think Tulane keeps it close. I don't think in my lifetime we're about the same age. Uh, that I, I would have thought I'd see an offense like like what's going on with, with Ensminger and Brady right now. Great collaboration between the two. Mm -hmm. They the Mutt and Jeff. You know, you know, Steve's in his 60s. Mm -hmm. The joint ain't even 30 years old yet. And yet they work together tremendously. And sometimes that doesn't work in this business. No. Even Egos. in the business you and I work in. Egos. Uh, sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. you get traveled a little bit. So, um, but the success, and Joe brought this up in the summer to me, and he was like, Mike, a year ago, nobody knew who I was. Mm -hmm. Think about that. A year ago, I didn't know who he nobody was. Nobody knew who Joe Brady was. He was in was. our backyard. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> so, um, and now he's become this hot offensive mm -hmm. coordinator. Um, I got to talk to Scott Woodard last week. He came to Thibodeau for a function mm -hmm. at the uh, Golden Tiger Booster Club. He was like, hey, you know, we're going to have to pay him now. I said, well, tell him what he told me. Nobody knew who I was a year ago, so maybe he cut you a deal. He's like, oh, I don't know about cutting deals. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's... He's really done great in using what he learned. And he explained it to me, the stuff I learned from Joe Moorhead at Penn State when he was there, before he went to Mississippi State. And he said, you know, with Sean, he said he's such a fertile-minded guy and that, you know, every week he's got something he wants to add to the table. Now, one of the things he told me I, I had to take a little bit of a back seat to in the NFL, they won't allow you to run that at that pace mm -hmm. But he said they do in the colleges. So he said that was something that he kind of picked up from watching some of the other teams run it. He said, you know, I, w I went back and watched Urban Meyer and what he did at Utah and what he did at Florida uh, with the spread offense. Uh, he said, you know, I watched some Houston tape, some Oklahoma tape. And he said, you know, a lot of Oklahoma because of Lincoln Riley. Yeah. And he said, you know, you pick up everything from so many people. And he said, give me the stat. And it is true. They've had 45 Division I wideouts produced in the state of Louisiana the last four years. Wow. My thing is, if you put that many guys in college, mm -hmm. man, my thing is, I'm going to throw the ball. Mm -hmm. I've got to do it. And, but it doesn't work without Joe. Right. Talk doesn't work without Burrow. Burrow. Talk about Burrow. He's just made remarkable progress in what he's been able to do as a passer. This was three days into camp last year. Um, so I go to one of the practices, and, you know, the coach is like, uh, you know, we talk, start talking about Miles Brennan, mm -hmm. and he's like, Burrow's the real McCoy. I was like, okay. I said, what McCoy? He said, no, Mike, he said, he's an NFL player. <clears throat> he said, you know who I compare him to? He said, you work with him. He sees Bobby J all over again. He said, now, here's the deal. He can't talk like him, but there's only two or three people breathing on this earth that can talk like right. Bobby. But he said, his ability to sit in the pocket, mm -hmm. throw accurately, He's tough. He said, Mike, I can't teach a guy to sit in that pocket and have somebody beating down on you, and you can make that throw down field. And you might have a lot of guys with arm talent, right. but how much that toughness is. And he said, just like Bobby said, you know, because Ed played with him at South Lafourche, played with him at Northwestern right. State. No matter what the score was, we believed he could win it for us. And he says, you know, he brings that confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, he says... Um, I told him, I said, you know, just talking to him, you know, he reminds me of almost like an assassin. You know, I don't say much. Hey, I got a job to do. Mm -hmm. hey, just move out of my way and I'm going to get it done. He's not much for banter, right. you know, into that deal. Uh, but, you know, he knows it. And I think he's put himself in a position now. It's going to be tough to not have Jalen Hurts to a Tunga Valoa, right. one, two in the Heisman. Right. He'll be in New York. Right. He'll be in a conversation now. He'll be in New York. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you, he's having that type of year. Yeah. And, man, I've seen Vanderbilt's defense mm -hmm. play. Good gracious. He may break the, that season game record right. uh, against the Commodores. Now, depending how long he'll play, <coughs> that'll be part of it. But he's done a great job. The offensive line protection has been very good. Mm -hmm. Now, where I'm negative I don't think they've gotten much of a push in the run game. Right. What about the running backs? Clyde with Solaire, Lillanaire Fournette, nice backs. I said With last the two week. Studs on, I mean, uh, you got you got you got Davis Price and you and you got Emory on, on the bench. Over the next few weeks, they got to see more time. Yeah. For, Price, Davis Price flashed last week. Yeah, and Emory 
flashed in the first week. Mm -hmm. But here's my thing about both. I understand why you didn't play him against mm -hmm. Texas. Me too. Uh, because Todd Orlando blitzes every play. Mm -hmm. Are you going to trust the 18 year old no. freshman to mm -hmm. pick up the, come on. That's one thing they didn't do at Destrahan. They didn't do right. with Tyron. He wasn't used to that, mm -hmm. picking up that blitz. And, and Edwards Hilaire did. Edwards Hilaire did. And Fournette did too. Yes. I mean, they're mm -hmm. used to it. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different, but I think you'll see more. Um, and it's kind of a thunder and lightning mm -hmm. combination here because you can see with Tyron, he's the thunder. Oh, yeah. And Emery, he's, he's the speed guy. guy. Yeah. And he can catch the football so well. What surprised me is how well Tyron can catch the football mm -hmm. coming out of the backfield. I hadn't seen a lot mm -hmm. of that, okay? Right. But he can catch the football real well. Mm -hmm. And now the distribution to receivers. Mm -hmm. And Ed had told me last week, listen, we've got to get Sullivan involved. Right. Four passes in the first yeah. half. Right, it happened. I want to get. I want to talk about the defense, but let's grab some calls. We got a full call board. Uh, Tom is in Metairie. Tom, welcome. You're on Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Tom. Hey, guys. Hey, uh, Mike. I'm glad you finally was talking about Marcus Williams. I've been kind of worried about him even since the latter part of last season. But I have a couple of questions for you. Bridgewater did not show leadership. His mannerisms. I mean, talk about that if you would. I mean, I, don't, I guess going forward he could change that. He had his head down a lot, making a lot of eye rolls. Cook, all I heard was a lot about Cook coming into the season. I don't see him in a game very much. And when he's in the game, he looks confused. And then lastly, the locker room. You know, we talk a lot about this strong locker room. Well, let's see if the locker room can pull together going forward out Drew Brees. I'll hang up and listen. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think the locker room's pulled together. You mm -hmm. kind of heard it. This a little week. bit about this week. Well, about, yeah. Man, but listen, you know, we are the Saints. Right. You know, we, okay, they all understand how what Drew means mm -hmm. to this team, but they still have Kamara and Michael Thomas. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed in Cook. Uh, I, I think that more. I expected more from him. Will that come in time? We'll Maybe. just have to see. It's not so much he looks confused. Drop the ball. You got to catch the you football. You got to catch the football in that. With Teddy, you know what? He's human. Mm hmm. And I'm sure Tom, I'm sure Sean Payton had a talk with him. Teddy, you the leader. Body language. You cannot show that type mm -hmm. of bad body language right. out on the field. And you frustrated. Right. You know that you want to do well, and you frustrated with everything out on the field. I'm sure him and Sean had a nice little talk about, hey, listen, they feed off of you. Mm -hmm. And so you can't pull that. Especially with the leader they've been having. Because that guy, right? Yeah, was no, no uh, right. was no put the head down. Yep. Now he showed us some frustration from time to time, but also he got in your face when he needed mm -hmm. to. He encouraged you when you needed to. Yes. He knew how to touch your button. That's something Teddy's got to mm -hmm. learn yep. on this team: which guys he can push and which guys he can't. Yep. Larry's in Kenner. Larry, welcome. You're on Inside the World Sports. Hey, Larry. Hey, Eric, how you doing, bud? All right, Larry, Larry, good to hear from you. Long, long time no see. Mike, Larry with the Who Dad truck. Hey, brother, what's going on? Uh, same old, same old. Uh, I just got one question. Uh, I'd like for both of y'all to answer. What do y'all think the outcome is going to come with the next six games or more games while Drew's out? Mm -hmm. And the second thing I got for y'all, y'all hit the nail on the head. Go to hell, Goodell needs to pack his rags and get out. We need a commission that that can do something for us, yeah, for the right. fans, that Thank you, pay their money for, for these games. Yep. I'll right, sit back you. and listen. Love your show, Eric. Thank All you, right, Larry. Appreciate it. Uh, Goodell ain't going nowhere. No, he ain't. Come on, come on. The owners, he is their secret service agent. You mm -hmm. take the bullet. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want no heat. You take the bullet. Owners. We paying you that 40 million bucks a year, for not for nothing. Right. You take that shot from them. Um, I just think that, you know, if you can go three and three, right, nobody's running no. away with the no. NFC no. South. That's right. Now, if you can do better than that, it's great. That's land, yeah. Uh, but I think if you can go three and three, which mm -hmm. I think is doable, mm -hmm. the Bears are going to be a tough mm -hmm. yeah. out. But come on, they ain't outscoring no. a, a ton of people. Mm -hmm. But if you can go three and three, so you hit the midway mark, mm -hmm. four and four, you got a shot here. You're going to get into the playoffs. Now, here's where it affects you home field advantage right. and that sort of thing. But you know what? Once you're in the playoffs, anything, anything can happen right. uh, at that spot. So my thing is Jacksonville, Tampa, Arizona, winnable games. Yep. Playing it with the two quarterbacks. I'm right there with you. Greg is in Homer. Greg, welcome. Hey, Greg. Uh, hey, guys. My question is, is what do you have to see out of Teddy Bridgewater to make you feel comfortable that he can succeed Drew Brees? And do you think that Sean Payton is looking at it like that, or he's looking at winning the games? Okay. 
and I'll hang up and listen. Mike? No, he's looking at winning the game. Right. He ain't worried about yeah. next year. Worried about the future. Uh, I think he's looking at winning the game and doing the best he can. The fact that you got to go to a two-quarterback system tells you all you need to know. Because mm -hmm. if you were completely – It would be Teddy's game. It would be it. Teddy's game. If you thought Taysom mm -hmm. Hill was the next Steve Young, he would be why is Teddy in he'd the be game? All right. It would be Taysom Hill's part. So, again, coaches, listen, I hate to break it to it's you. It's true. I got them in my family. Mm -hmm. They do lie. It's coach speak. It's a well, nice way of saying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> uh, I guess. But, you know, they do swerve around yeah. that. But, again, I, I just think the, the successor to Drew Brees mm -hmm. is not on the roster. He's taking a snap. You've been saying it for years. I've been saying it for years. Hopefully that guy graduates. Yeah, no doubt. Jason is at home. He's our final call. Jason, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Thank you, guys. Quick uh, comment and then a quick question. Mike, we've obviously seen the – the evolution in the last decade and a half of the slot receiver. And yep. my question for you as a scout, and what is a coach looking for when he's trying to differentiate whether a defensive back will be on the uh, in the slot position covering that guy or on the edges? And what skill sets kind of differentiate the two? That's my question, and I'll uh, go ahead and listen. Thank yeah, you, Yeah, it's a good question because now so many teams are playing their best receiver in the mm -hmm. slot. You know, Julian Edelman, you're right. in the slot. Mm -hmm. Antonio Brown, in the slot. Right. So it's most of the time a smaller defensive back, mm -hmm. and you better get a jam on him and quickly because you're playing up against probably the most talented receiver. Right. So you're looking for the same thing you look for an outside guy. Not, he doesn't necessarily have to be that six foot one corner. You can do it at 5'10, 5'11, but you got to be physical to me to throw you off the initial route, right. to reroute you. Yes. The timing today, because what you see today in today's game is so much quick three-step drop, get rid of it. Okay, if I stop the timing off of that, mm -hmm. then you've got to hold it, got to hold the football. So uh, you're probably looking for a little smaller player in the slot, okay. a guy that's versatile, uh, but, you know, you're still looking for the gotta same. He's got to be physical, too. He's got to be physical. His back pedal's got to mm -hmm. be quick. Mm -hmm. But you're looking for a guy who's a quick pickup to know where that quarterback's going with the ball. Mm -hmm. So much sports today. And it's a lack of them now because what's happened, seven on sevens changed the world. In essence, everybody won't play on offense. Yeah. My thing, if I had a really talented son, I would tell him, you know what? You got a lot of receivers. Mm -hmm. Ain't got a lot of corners. Quarterbacks make a lot of money. And they make a lot of money in this yeah. league. And so uh, the evolution of the game with the short, mm -hmm. quick pass, you got to be physical. You got to have the skill set to go one on one. But I think being able to pick up the ball peripherally, and that's something I watch a lot in a corner, mm -hmm. how well he can pick it up. And you saw even at the end with Tredavious White, what they did with him, he was covering the slot guy. Right. He wasn't out on the edges, True. he was a slot corner uh, toward the end at LSU. And that's what Tyron does yes. so well. Because he can also, he's a physical guy and can play the run yeah, well. No doubt. Mike Dettelier, as always, thanks so much for Thank being Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it, bud. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night right here on WLAE TV at uh, 10 p.m. 9 o'clock. Uh, that's statewide on Pelican Sports Television every Friday night. You can catch me on the radio, Sports 1280, 101.1 FM HD2 and the iHeartRadio app. That's noon to two weekdays. Listen live, download the podcast at ericasher.com. All the previous episodes of this program is also at ericasher.com com as well. Uh, special thanks to our underwriters, also the WLA production staff, uh, and also Mike Dettelier as well, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Naila Jones, Ali Chacon, and my director, William Hill. I'm Eric Asher. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. <laughs>